again, welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming here this evening. Um, this is our part two on the sacraments, um, and we're very grateful that we are able to video these. I know it's a little more awkward for all of you because whoever's speaking is a little bit more probably reserved, um, but it is going to come in very handy, um, especially for our brothers and sisters who want to be part of this confirmation process are in our Panama City. Um, we don't even know if they're there, how their houses are, or anything. So for them to be able to have these videos is going to be um, great because I don't think we're going to be able to meet with them at least for a little while. So thank you for your patience if we're not as animated and alive as we possibly should be doing this. All right. I'm going to begin with parts of Psalm 51 tonight for our prayer because it ties in a bit to what we are talking about. So again, knowing we are in God's presence, let us begin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sins. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise, for you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to offer you a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. A sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Um, I chose that because it fits into how and what we are partially talking about tonight. If you recall, in the last session, we talked about the three sacraments of initiation, which are confirmation and Eucharist, okay? So tonight, we're going to talk about the sacraments of what we call healing and the sacraments of service, the other four sacraments. And we're going to start with the sacraments of healing. According to what is actually canon law, in the sacrament of penance, the faithful who confess their sins to a legitimate minister are sorry for them and intend to reform themselves, obtain from God, through the absolution imparted by the same minister, forgiveness for their sins that they have committed after baptism, and at the same time reconciled with the church by which they have wounded by sinning. Now that says a whole lot, doesn't it? And as we go on right now, we're going to unpack this at least a little bit, right? We have to remember that our ability to recognize our sins and our ability to change, to be converted in that sense, to have conversion of heart, mind, and it comes because God gives that to us. God takes the initiative. God is always there, ready, willing to forgive. Right? We just have to acknowledge our need for that forgiveness. And throughout all of sacred scripture, Divine mercy and conversion are constant themes. What I started out with tonight is actually from Psalm 51, which is the Psalm of David, the great King David who seriously sinned. You remember the story of David? David's up on the roof and looks down and sees a wonderful lady and is attracted to her, Bathsheba and brings her up into his apartment, has relations with her. Now the trick is, she's married to Uriah. Little complication here, right? And guess what happens? She becomes pregnant. So he tries to get Uriah out from the battlefield and come home and have relations with his wife, so it will appear that it is Uriah's child. Uriah comes back and says, no, 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 you know, the men are out on the battlefield, I'll just sleep here. I can't go back to my house, it wouldn't be right. So when that doesn't work for David, 
what does David do? He sends a message with Uriah and says, put Uriah in the front of the battle line. Now, in the front of the battle line, what's probably going to happen? He's going to get killed, right? And so David basically sends Uriah to his death. And then he takes Bathsheba to himself. And then one of the prophets comes and says to him, you know, there was this rich man, and he took this poor man's lamb. You know, what should happen to that rich man who took the poor man's lamb? And David's like, you know, should be put to death. And then it kind of dawns on David, that man is me. And I have sinned. And Psalm 51 that we had, part that I read, there's much more to it, right, is David's psalm of repentance, his realization that he has sinned. Did God kill him then? Did God stop him from being king? No, because God's forgiveness is always there. And David went on as king. So it's a psalm that expresses that contrition and that trust in God. In the Gospels, we have lots of times of Jesus forgiving sins, right? Often it's a conjunction with when he heals somebody. But he heals somebody and then tells them to go and sin no more, right? He calls them to that conversion of heart. Luke's Gospel in particular, he has the lost sheep, he has the lost coin, he has that famous story that we call the prodigal son, but really it should be the forgiving father because it's the father in that parable in that story who's waiting and ready and instantly forgives the son. That is how God is with us, always ready to forgive. How do we know we have that forgiveness? Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead to reconcile sinful people with God through the forgiveness of sins and the gift of new life with the triune God. That was Jesus' whole purpose in coming, was to be able to reconcile us back. You know, we could do a lot of theology and talk about, you know, the breach had become between God and man. Who could repair that? Only a God-man. Man-God, whichever way you want to put it. And that is Jesus Christ. And so he came that we might have that forgiveness and be able to have that new life. That was his whole point. And think about Jesus on that cross. He forgave those who were killing him, right? He basically said, Father, don't hold this against them. And then he's got two people who are crucified with him, right? One on his left and one on his right. And one of them says, this, you know, I know that you're innocent. And Jesus says to him, this day you'll be with me in paradise. So you have that repentant thief who is guaranteed eternal salvation from Jesus on the cross. And Jesus gives that to us also. Whenever we are ready to say, I know I've done wrong. I'm sorry for this. In a sense like that prodigal son, take me back. I'm not worthy of it, but take me back. And Jesus with the Father is there all the time to say, come back. He's ready to forgive us before we're ready to ask for forgiveness. Only God can forgive sins. But Jesus felt that we're human. We needed that human touch. And so Jesus willed that the church should be the instrument of forgiveness on earth, that we needed that human touch to be reconciled, yes, with God, but also with the church. And that is the sacrament that officially is called the sacrament of penance, 
We call it the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Sometimes we call it Confession. It's got more names than it probably needs to have. All meaning the same thing. All acknowledging that we have sinned, turned from God, and that we need and want to turn back to him. Right? So the sacrament doesn't have any meaning unless we look at it that it's our conversion from sin and a turn to God. What does sin do? Right? And you know, there's all kinds of descriptions of sin. A lot from the Hebrew says you miss the mark. Don't quite make it right. Right? What it does is harms that relationship that you and I have with God and damages our communion with the church. Conversion is the beginning of that journey back to God. My recognition that I've separated myself in some way from God. So conversion has to have a change of heart as well as a change of actions. So there's a dual thing here. Can I do both, either one or both on my own? No, it's really God's grace that allows me to do it. God touching us to say, come back. So God's grace is what gives us that ability to have that change of heart, to change our actions as we might need to. So what's really all part of this sacrament that we call penance? Well, the first thing is you have to have contrition. Contrition is basically saying we're sorry for our sins. We want to turn away from evil and turn to God. We want to try to avoid the sin in the future. Now, notice I'm saying we want to avoid. We want to turn back. Might we fall again? Probably yes. Okay? Probably yes. But are we willing to work to being better? As I often said when I worked with middle school and high school youth, okay? So maybe I lie 50 times a day. But I start to have this conversion of heart. Oh, and the next week maybe I only lie 45 times a day. And maybe the next week only 40. Am I converting? Am I changing my actions? Am I changing my heart? Yes. Just because I realize I lie a lot doesn't mean I'm instantly going to stop lying. But am I willing to work at it? Am I willing to try? Now, we speak of sin in the Catholic Church in kind of, I guess you would say, two categories, whatever you want to call it, right? Sins are rightly evaluated according to their gravity. How grave are they? So we call sins to be either mortal or to be venial. Okay? And if you look at scripture, there really is a distinction already evident in there that became a part of our Catholic tradition and really is collaborated by our own experiences. Are there some things we might do that we realize could really cut us off from God and from the community, and other things that kind of just weaken that relationship. The sins we call mortal destroy the charity in our heart by a grave violation of God's law and turns us away from God, who is his ultimate end and good, by preferring an inferior good to him. Now, I'm not going to stand here and do a list of mortal sins, but I think you could understand that if I would deliberately right now go over and kill Chris, who's nice enough to be here recording all of this, all right, would that be a serious sin? Would that be a mortal sin? Yeah, some of you might try and stop me in the process, all right? But if I did that, that's, I, I'm seriously breaking God's law. Who shall not kill, all right? So I think you can think through some things very easily that are very serious, that do break that relationship with God and with community. We prefer some interior good because it might make me feel good. That, you know, no, I don't think it would make me feel good to have killed Chris, but okay, but you get the idea of what I'm trying to say, right? Venial sins 
allows charity to subsist even though it offends and wounds. So venial sins are those which we, yes, we're falling away from what is the perfect thing to do, but we haven't cut ourselves off entirely from God. So maybe I didn't pray as I should pray. Maybe I haven't put God first as that first commandment says all the time. But against that first communion, I could also gravely say, couldn't I? Because I could make money, power, fame, anything, the idol that would come before God. So there's a difference there, right? If I make something else the idol instead of God, I'm seriously cutting myself off. If sometimes I just don't give God the best place I should in my life, have I separated myself from him? Yes. So we can have venial sins and we can have mortal sins, right? And our conscience, that little voice within us, is what really tells us what is right and wrong. But we have to develop that conscience, and we could spend another whole class on developing your conscience, but just briefly the idea, helping our conscience to know what's right and wrong. Some things we'll know naturally, because I really do believe that in people, there's a natural thing that tells us not to kill someone else without even looking at God's law. Most of, a lot of the Ten Commandments are really natural law. Right? So what is innately within us? And then what has God taught us through Old Testament scripture, through New Testament and Jesus' teaching? And then because Jesus entrusted to his church scripture and tradition. What does the church teach us about something? Because the church takes God's teachings and interprets them for us in light of today. Right? Because some of the things that we have today, in Jesus' time, they wouldn't have even thought about, right? Now we have to deal with end-of-life issues, right? And what do we do and what don't we do and so forth. Do they really have to do that in Jesus' time? No, you kind of just died naturally if somebody didn't kill you, right? So what the church does is helps us to take Jesus' teaching and apply him to our life. But we have to study, look at, listen to what the church is teaching and read what Jesus is teaching us in order to form that conscience to know what's right and what's wrong. And this is a developing process, right? Those of you who have, have or had children know that it's a little slow process, isn't it? Getting them to have an understanding of right and wrong, right? They have to, in a sense, be shown it and taught it. And that doesn't end when we get to be 10 or 12 or 15 or 21. That goes on the rest of our lives, right? So we have to develop the conscience to know what is right and what is wrong. So our first thing is that sense of looking at our own life. And that's why it is always suggested that every night before we go to sleep, we look back through the day. What were the good things of the day? And what were the things that maybe weren't so good and weren't so right? to have that realization, yes, to express our sorrow, so that when we do go to the sacrament, we already have that sense of what's right and what's wrong. Once we have that sense of right and wrong and that sense of contrition, then, yes, we have what we really call the confession of our sins, right? The telling of our sins to the priest who represents Christ, and in doing so, we are liberated from the sins that might trouble our hearts. And it also makes us possible to be reconciled with God and with others. Right? When we name those sins, we've got to face our failings more honestly and accept the responsibility for them. There's something about naming it, right? And think back again, either when you were a child or you had children, if 
they did something wrong, you wanted them to admit it, or somebody wanted you to admit it, right? To acknowledge it so that you recognized that you had done the wrong. That doesn't really change as we grow up, all right? So by naming them, we as the penitent, before the priest representing Christ, face our feelings more honestly and accept responsibility for our sins. And two things to remember. First of all, the priest is human. The priest sins himself. The priest has to go to the sacrament of reconciliation. He can't forgive his own sins, okay? Pope doesn't even forgive his own sins. You've probably seen pictures of the Pope kneeling down for the sacrament, all right? So first thing is to remember that priest is human, but sitting there, he represents Christ, all right? And through what we call the seal of the sacrament of reconciliation, he cannot say anything to anyone about what you have said to him. There have been priests who have died because they would not break that seal. And actually, we have some places in our world right now where governments want to force them, and they are saying, the priests are saying, we won't. We'll die first. Australia. Mm -hmm. Australia right now. Okay? So the priests take that very, very seriously. They will not later say to you if they had recognized you or if you did go face to face and they know who you are, they won't later say to you, oh, when you, you, that was horrible what you did. Mm -mm. Nor will they tell anyone else. That's what we always tell the kids. Don't worry, they won't tell mom and dad. All right? Mm -hmm. Once we have accepted and acknowledged our sins, then the priest gives us absolution to set us free from our sins and to bring us that pardon. Remember, he's representing Christ. And he says these words, God the Father of mercies, through the death and resurrection of his Son, has reconciled the world to himself and sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. Through the ministry of the church, may God give you pardon and peace, and I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. A couple of things in there. Notice he's calling God the Father of mercy. Someone once said, God is mercy upon mercy upon mercy upon mercy. And it is through the death and resurrection of his son Jesus that he has reconciled the world to himself, sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. Because if you go back to Scripture, to actually the night of the resurrection, Jesus appears through all the locked doors and all. And one of the things he says to his apostles is, receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. Whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. Now, why would any priest not give absolution? Because they can tell the person isn't really sorry and doesn't want to try not to do it again. Because those are two conditions on us as the penitent, as the receiver of the sacrament. Right? Through the ministry of the church, the priest isn't doing this on his own, is he? He's doing it as part of the church. He asks that God gives us pardon and peace. And then he absolves us from our sins. And notice in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the last part of the sacrament is the sense of making satisfaction, right? The priest will su suggest something that we do that we usually call the penance. That's why it's sometimes called the sacrament of penance. He'll ask us to do something to show, to make up in a sense, and to show that we want to do better. And isn't it true as little children that when we know we've hurt mom or dad, we want to do something to make it up. 
I mean, I remember very distinctly, I don't remember what I did, but I remember going out in our backyard and picking the dandelions and taking them to my mother now. You know, dandelions are not the prettiest or best of flowers, but I could pick the dandelions. I didn't dare pick the roses, but I could pick the dandelions, and I brought them to her trying to make up because I knew I had hurt her. So God asks us to do something to make satisfaction for our sins, something to show that we're going to be better. All right? And it used to be a lot that it was say so many prayers, but most priests now look at what can we do to change our lives. What is it that we've done wrong that we can perhaps to some person we've heard make up? And yes, if we've stolen things, we're supposed to make satisfaction, right? But he tries to find something that we can do that will help us to change and have that conversion. So that is our sacrament of reconciliation, of penance, whatever you want to call it. What does it do for us? Hey, we're reconciled with God and with the church. You know, and I keep saying this with the church, but think about it. Think about anything you might have done wrong that is sinful. Indirectly, does it hurt somebody else and hurt the church? Yeah. It brings us a peace of conscience, because let's face it, when we've done something wrong, do we really have that little nagging thing in our minds of, I really shouldn't have done that, that wasn't the best thing to do? Yeah. Yeah. And so expressing that sinfulness and receiving that forgiveness, we have a peace within our conscience. We have the remission of eternal punishment due to mortal sin, as well as some degree in sense of the temporal, and that's why the making up idea and the satisfaction. But it also has greater power to help us to face whatever challenges spiritually we have. So if I've really got a challenge with a particular sin, by going to confession and expressing sorrow for that sin, God's grace is there to help me overcome it, to help me the next time I'm faced with the temptation for it to not give in. So there's what we would, remember I mentioned a little bit last week, actual grace. With the sacrament comes that actual grace to help us to become better. So it is our sacrament, yes, of reconciling us with God, of enabling us to become better. I could go on and on, but um, i got three more sacraments to cover here, right? Our second sacrament of healing. First one is penance or reconciliation. What's the second one? Anointing. Anointing of the sick, okay? And for those of you who are older, often we didn't refer to it as anointing of the sick, we just called it viaticum, which was a mistake, right? Because it gave a connotation to it, we'll see, that isn't always true, right? The anointing of the sick, by which the church commends the faithful who are dangerously ill to the suffering and glorified Lord in in order that he might relieve and save them, is confirmed by anointing them with oil and pronouncing the word prescribed in the actual liturgical books, right? Think about it again. Jesus healed the sick all the time, didn't he? I mean, tons of them, all right? The core message of all those stories is his plan to conquer sin and death by his dying and rising, right? So think about all the different times when he healed people, from the lepers, from the blind man, from the paralytic that got dropped down through the ceiling, that must have been quite a scene. Just picture if right now the ceiling opened and somebody got lowered down. The crowd must have wondered really what was going on, right? Jesus healed them, but he also said your sins are forgiven, right? St. James, in his letter that we read in Scripture, says, Is anyone among you sick? He should summon the presbyters, the priests of the church, and they should pray over him and anoint him with the oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. 
So notice this is a sacrament coming again from Scripture. That healing ministry of Jesus, he left to his church to continue. Now, we used to often think that this was the sacrament if you were dying. And that's not true. We don't have to wait till a person is dying to receive the sacrament. Any serious illness, serious of nature of illness, or that might be an acute, it might be a chronic. Um, older people in weak conditions, even if they're no longer illness, you know, no particular illness. People before surgery. Can I receive the sacrament more than once? Yes, okay? Even within the same illness. So it's a repeatable sacrament. It is a sacrament to help us to understand sickness and suffering. Priests and bishops are the ministers of this sacrament. And often it'll start with a little penitential rite of asking for forgiveness. Scripture is read often from James's letter, okay, or one of the healing stories of Jesus. And then the priest lays his hands on the head of the sick person. And then anoints him or her with the blessed oil of the sick on the forehead and the hands. That oil of the sick is blessed by the bishop during Holy Week, what is called the chrism mass. It's one of those three oils of the sick, of the catechumens, and then chrism. And as he anoints the forehead and hands, he says, through this holy anointing, may the Lord in his love and mercy help you with the grace of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who frees you from your sins save you and raise you up. Now we have to be clear here. The primary effect of the sacrament is a spiritual healing. Most people who receive the sacrament don't have a miraculous physical healing. There's a difference here. What does the sacrament do for the person receiving them? It gives them that peace and comfort of knowing God and the church is with them even though they might not be physically healed. And if you've ever been the person receiving it, that's very true. But if you're also the family who's with that person, it brings to the family a sense of peace because we have taken this sick person and given him, in a sense, to the Lord, that the Lord will take care of him. I notice there's a laying on of hands If you recall, I said in confirmation, the bishop extends his hands, and we're going to see that laying on of hands is a sign from the Old Testament of the power. And so the priest, through that gesture, is calling down the Holy Spirit to be with that person, to bring that person peace. Whether there's physical healing or not, there's that spiritual healing that is the peace and allows the person to see their suffering as part and united to the suffering of Jesus Christ. Okay. Yes, usually if someone is dying, the sacrament will be given. And that's where viaticum came as the, the sacrament on your way to new life. And that's when we thought it could only be for those who were dying. And often the sacrament will be given, and if possible, the Eucharist. So yes, if someone is dying, the sacrament is appropriate, but it can also be when someone is ill at any time. So it's a comforting, a healing. Two very interesting sacraments, aren't they? They are to give us the peace that we need to go on. Two sacraments of healing. Both are repeatable, right? Remember we said baptism is once, confirmation is once, but Eucharist is repeated, but both of these can be 
repeated, often, right? Church encourage us is to have people who could use it be anointed in the sacrament. In fact, many of our parishes, especially around February 11th, because February 11th is the Feast of Our Lady of Lourdes, and probably most of you are very aware that that is a place of healing for many people who go to Lourdes for actual physical healing as well as spiritual healing. So in many of our parishes around that date, they will have communal anointings of the sick where they invite anyone who's eligible for the sacrament. Does that include someone who might be suffering mentally? Yes, okay, to come and to be anointed, and then often the parish will have a luncheon or something after it for them, right? So the sacrament does have a very important and special place. The sacrament of healing that is very personal reconciliation, the church encourages us to receive it often. It says if we're in mortal sin, we got to receive it at least once a year. But it encourages us, even if we're not in mortal sin, we're only, you know, those venial sins can wear us down and get the help that we need to overcome them. So the church encourages us to receive the sacrament of reconciliation often. So there are two repeatable sacraments that I think sometimes we kind of forget, but they're there for our healing, for our peace. That moves us on to the sacraments of of service, we call it, okay? And you're going to say, what in the world? Kind of, what do you mean by service? And you're thinking about the two sacraments that are left, and, well, one of them you can see is service, but the other you're probably wondering, hmm, how does that work? Well, let's look at the one you, you think of as being of service first, which we call holy ardors. And you'll notice it has an S on it. This sacrament confers a special grace for a particular mission in the church. It's the mission that was entrusted to the apostles that continues in the church. The person who receives the sacrament is called to exercise a sacred power in the name of and with the authority of Christ for the service of the people of God. Exercise a sacred power in the name of and with the authority of Christ. Does a priest do things on his own? Mm -mm. And why? For the service of the people of God. Now I said there, we called it holy ardors with an S, and that's because actually there are three ardors within it. All right? The office of ardor of bishop this is the fullness of the sacrament of holy orders. These are the legitimate successors of the apostles. And we say we could trace back that this person was consecrated bishop by this person, by this person. A little harder now that we're 2,000 years into the history of the church, but technically it could be traced all the way back to one of the apostles. Within it, there are three offices. They are to be teachers, sanctifiers, and rulers. Teaching, sanctifying, and ruling. They are given the care of a particular church. Right. They are to be shepherd of that church. They are to gather the flock. They are to protect the flock. They are to teach the flock. Right? That teaching, sanctifying, ruling of the flock. We're the flock, right? Now, as the church grew, the original overseers, as they were called, or what we call now bishops, was very easy because churches were in small groups. As the church grew, and the bishop couldn't be everywhere, the second order developed, which we call priests, and the third order developed, which we call deacons, to assist him in his role. And I think you can see how that could be. Could Bishop Bill be everywhere in this diocese at any one time? No, right? Try a Sunday morning. It would be pretty hard, right? So the priests are here to assist the bishop. 
and so are the deacons. So let's look at those. The order or office of priest. Okay. They are configured to Christ and enabled to act in the name of Christ. Notice, not on their own, but in the name of Christ. They are co-workers with the bishop. They don't operate on their own. The priest operates in conjunction <coughs> with the bishop. They are consecrated to preach the gospel, celebrate, celebrate divine worship, and shepherd the faithful. So notice, they preach, they lead worship, they shepherd. Is that sort of the bishop that moves that up a step in teaching, sanctifying, and ruling? Okay. They are ordained for our universal mission, which is exercised in a particular church. Right? So they are ordained as priests for the whole universal church, but they exercise it in a particular church. The particular church for us is the Diocese of Pensacola, Tallahassee. All right? They have what we call faculties to celebrate Mass, the sacraments, etc., in this particular diocese. When they go to another diocese, say, to celebrate somebody's wedding, they have to bring with them something that shows, signed usually by our Chancellor Monsignor Reed or by Bishop himself, that they have faculties in this diocese and that they are in good standing within this diocese. Otherwise, they can't celebrate that wedding somewhere else. All right? So while they're ordained in the sense of the universal church, they have their exercising of it within a particular church. Right? They exercise their ministry in what's a sacramental brotherhood with the other priests who form what we call presbyterate. Right? So that together with the other priests within the diocese, they work as one under and in conjunction with the bishop. If they're not in communion with the bishop, there's a little problem. All right? Then we have the office of deacon. Deacons are ordained for service to the church. That's the role of the deacon, straight service. Notice it doesn't talk about necessarily their... Um, celebrating divine worship, their preaching, they are ordained for service to the church and are under the authority of the bishop. The bishop assigns them what ministry of service and where they will be doing that ministry. Yes, they do have a ministry of the word, right? In most cases, deacons can preach. Yes, they have a part in divine worship, but they're limited. They don't celebrate all the sacraments. Deacons can baptize in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the church. Okay? And deacons, they can't forgive sins. They can't consecrate the Eucharist. They cannot do anointing of the sick. Now, can they distribute communion? Yes, okay, but laity can also, right? So they're really of service. They can also, we'll see, be the witness to a marriage. Right? But their real thing is pastoral care and charity. So deacons are called to care for people, to be of service to people. They are called in charity. Now, I'm going to pause here because somebody's going to thinking, okay, wait a second here, right? In the Roman Catholic Church, we in a sense have two, what's the right word to use, farms maybe, or two types of deacons. We have those deacons that we call transitional who are on their way to being ordained as priests. 
okay? And usually that happens about a year before they're ordained a priest. And we call them transitional because they're not going to stay deacons. They're going to become priests. And with basically the Second Vatican Council came back, which was part of the early church, what we call the permanent deacon. They're not transitioning to priesthood. They really won't. Okay, under a rare circumstance, they could, but they don't, right? Transitional deacons in our Latin Rite Roman Catholic Church are not and will not marry. Well, they could have been married and their spouse is deceased, right? Permanent deacons can be married, right? So we have a little difference here, right? Tradi transitional are going on to priesthood. Permanent deacons are permanent. They don't go on to priesthood. And they are really to be of service in charity and in pastoral care. So many of our deacons do visit the sick, bring communion to the sick. Many of them will teach. Many of them do other works of mercy. That's their primary thing. You think of the deacons as up on the altar, right, with the priest during Mass, assisting him. That's actually a secondary thing for them. Their real thing is to be of service to the people in charity and pastoral care. Now, how does all this happen that you get to be these different orders? Obviously, there's a lot of preparation before any one of them. What, how is the sacrament actually celebrated or conferred? It's by the imposition of hands by a validly ordained bishop in union with the Holy See. Notice the imposition of hands, the passing down of the grace of the power. See how we use a lot of the same symbols? Right? And that comes from the Old Testament. By a validly ordained bishop. So deacons and priests are both ordained by a validly ordained bishop. Likewise, the bishop is ordained bishop by another validly ordained bishop. If you recall, some of you can remember possibly Bishop Park's ordination and Bishop Bill's ordination. There were usually several priests, but there's a main celebrating bishop that is in union with the Holy See. There is a solemn prayer of consecration for outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit proper to the ministry for which they are being ordained. So there's a prayer with deacons, a prayer with priests, a prayer with bishop, asking for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit so they'll have them to do that particular ministry for which they're being ordained. So do deacons need, in a sense, certain graces and gifts to be deacons Yes. Do priests need those, but some other ones also? And does the bishop need all of that with some other ones also? Mm -hmm. So each prayer calls down the Holy Spirit upon them with the gifts that they will need for that particular ministry. <coughs> with the deacons, you know, <coughs> the gospels are placed on their head that they might preach those words and keep the words of those Gospels. Priest's hands are anointed because those are the hands that are going to forgive. Those are the hands that are going to hold the Eucharist for consecration. Okay. And with a bishop, oil is poured on his head. So again, you know, we got differing ways and means of showing the different steps of ordination. For whichever order it is, there's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The person is configured to Christ. And like two of the sacraments that we talked about last week, there is an indelible spiritual character. Anybody remember which ones we said left a mark? Which ones did we talk about last week that only are received once? Baptism, Baptism and confirmation. Right? And we said both of those leave a mark on us. That's why they're only one. So likewise with ordination. Right? They cannot be repeated. 
A priest doesn't get ordained every year. He celebrates his anniversary, maybe, but he's not reordained, okay? They act in the person of Christ, who is the head of the church, and they act in the name of the church. Deacons, priests, bishops don't act on their own. They act in the person of Christ and in the name of the church. Okay? And I think you realize how all of them are in service to all of us. All these sacraments we're talking about really wouldn't take place without our ordained ministers. Okay? Validly ordained ministers. Well, that gets me to the last of our seven sacraments, the other sacrament of service. I got a question back there. Can they be unordained? Can they be unordained? Well, I don't think we use the term unordained, but I know what you're saying. Yes, technically, for very grave reasons, they can be what we call laicized, that they no longer can function, have the faculties to act as deacon, priest, or bishop. That's a rare thing. Does the bishop impose that? No, actually, they have to ask the Holy See, and it has to be finally approved by the Pope. Most cases, it's a request, but it could also be imposed. Can you voluntarily, what? I don't want to say, I don't know the word. Well, technically, you still got the character mark. What you undo or don't have is the faculties, the ability to act in the name of the church, to do all the things of sacraments, etc. You're a priest, but you're not. You're not a functioning priest, I guess you would say. Okay. Stop being a priest. Right. And they technically need to get the permission to become laicized okay. before they can validly marry within the church. Yeah. If they choose on their own just to leave without going through the proper right. channels, etc., and get married, the church does not see that as a valid marriage because they are not free to marry, all right? Because one of the things in the step as a transitional deacon is when they make the promise of celibacy, all right? We've talked about priests, we've talked about bishops, and we've talked about deacons, all are men. In the Roman rite of the Catholic where Church, the, yes. Where are, the women, where are, are women ordained? No. Okay, I am not ordained. Many people falsely think that. They believe that religious women and brothers, sisters and brothers, are ordained. I am not ordained. So you, you make vows? I make vows, yes. Okay, and when we talk in the church about the clergy, the ordained, and the laity, the non-ordained, I'm part of that non-ordained. I'm part of that laity, okay? I am not ordained. I can't celebrate... I mean, in case of emergency, can I baptize? Yeah. I can't forgive your sins. I can't consecrate Eucharist. I can't do anointing of the sick. Okay? So I am not ordained. I am not part of clergy. I'm part of laity. Okay? Now, somebody's probably thinking, but then what's this cardinal bit? Okay? Who are cardinals in this whole thing? All right? Cardinals are basically simply usually bishops who are chosen to be, in a sense, what you would call special advisors to the Pope. What has basically come out mostly is they elect the um, Pope, right? That's the main part of them, okay? So that's, they're not, it's not an order of, you know, within holy orders, it is simply a title given, sort of, I don't want to say honorary, but it gives them the ability to be part 
of those who elect the Pope. As long as you're under 80 years of age. Who's a Monsignor? What is that? Monsignor, again, is a title of honor. Okay, so if a priest has really shown in a very special way service to the church, then the bishop of the diocese can suggest them to be named a Monsignor. But approval, again, is through the papacy? And then, yes, it goes through to the Vatican, to the Holy See. Okay? So it's not, you know, they can't decide, oh, I like this priest, therefore. They have to present the reasons why this priest should become, have the title of Monsignor. Okay? Are bishops subordinate? I mean, to There's cardinals, a, for instance. No. Bishops are only subordinate to the Holy Father, to the Pope. Okay. Okay? Cardinals are just kind of a, a title thing in there, and they're... They're usually people who have been of great service to the church. Right. Somebody doesn't get named a cardinal out of nothing, you know what I mean? Um, so that then they're really as advisors and then to elect the pope, right? And the pope chooses them, and Pope Francis has really, shall I say, expanded the sense of cardinals all over the world. So he has named bishops in some of the smaller countries, definitely more from what you or I might call the third world, Africa and South America, right? So he has really tried to broaden and make more universal the college of cardinals that will elect the next pope. Okay? exploding in Africa. Yes, the church is growing in Africa, definitely, right? Um, and we have to be aware that, you know, they have a different culture. And part of Vatican II said, yes, we have to have the church be adaptable to the culture, right? Um, and so that's another whole, <laughs> another whole topic. We could have had about 30 classes, couldn't we? But we didn't. We only made this five now in January, right? So last sacrament, right? The sacrament of matrimony. Or we usually call it marriage, all right? And the Code of Canon Law says, the matrimonial covenant by which a man and a woman's woman establish between themselves a partnership of the whole of life, and which is ordered by its nature by the good of the spouses and the procreation and education of offspring, has been raised by Christ the Lord to the dignity of the sacrament between the baptized. Now, what is that all saying? Notice it's saying it's a covenant. Covenant's different than a contract, isn't it? Right? Covenant is more of a partnership. Usually in a contract, one person says they'll do something for the other person. Covenant is this agreement, this working together, by which a man and a woman they established between themselves a partnership. And that partnership is ordered by its nature to the good of the spouses and the procreation and education of offspring. The first thing of a marriage, of that covenant of a man and a woman, is they're supposed to help each other get to heaven. They're supposed to help the other. Work for themselves, yes, to get to heaven, but help the other person get to heaven. All right? And then, yes, for the procreation, education of offspring. And Christ has raised this covenant, this relationship, to the dignity of a sacrament between the baptized. For this reason, a valid matrimonial contract cannot exist between the baptized without being, by that fact, a sacrament. It's the sign and symbol, really, of the unity of Christ and his church, of the unity of the human being with God. The essential properties of marriage are unity and indissolvability. 
which in Christian marriage obtain a special firmness by reason of the sacrament. This is the only sacrament in which the priest, deacon, obviously bishop, is not the celebrant, but is the witness. The priest doesn't marry the man and the wife. They marry each other. Okay? And within the celebration of this sacrament, a Catholic must express his or her consent in the presence of the priest or deacon and two witnesses. Right? Now, there can be some dispensations here when one is a Catholic is marrying a non Catholic. All right? But basically, it's to be in the presence of the priest or deacon with two witnesses. The consent is given when the man and the woman manifest the will to give themselves to each other irrevocably in order to live a covenant of faithful and fruitful love. If you'll notice, I was just at a wedding on Saturday, and you'll notice if you go to a wedding, they are asked if they have come freely. And if they freely consent to this, right? You can't have a real marriage if somebody's forced into it, can you? The real marriage is the free consent of both of them to live this covenant. For a valid marriage, the consent must have as its object true matrimony and be a human act which is conscious and free and not determined by duress or coercion. So it has to be freely given, right? That consent and that marriage covenant. And in the eyes of the church, when two people knowingly, freely, consciously, notice what kind of words I'm using here, give that consent. If something like is missing, if I really was under duress, has, is that a true valid marriage? No. Right. I have to know what I'm doing. I have to freely consent to do it. Or otherwise, I'm not really making that covenant. All right? Now, sometimes we talk about mixed marriages. Gee, that's a bad term, but we do it. What we're really saying is it's a Catholic marrying a baptized non-Catholic. And technically, for a Catholic to do that, they have to have permission from the bishop, right? And that's why the priest will apply for the permission that this takes place. Is it always usually granted? Yes, okay? If we have a marriage between a Catholic and a non-baptized person, we really don't say it's a sacramental marriage. because one person has never received the sacrament of baptism, okay? And technically, for a Catholic to marry a non-baptized person, you have to have a dispensation from the bishop to do these, okay? In either of those cases also, it's essential that the spouses do not exclu exclude the acceptance of the essential ends of marriage and the properties of marriage. In other words, they have to say, okay, this is this covenant. It's indissoluble. And as we said, the ends are for to bring each other to heaven and for the procreation and education of children. All right? And so it's necessary for the Catholic Party to accept that obligation of which the non-Catholic party has been advised so that they can persevere in their own faith and assure the baptism and education of the children. So this is all stuff that has to be worked out way before the marriage. And I think if you think about what I am saying about marriage, you can be understand why the church 
has that period of preparation before the couple actually commits to each other. Have they really talked about how they're going to live this life together and some of the things that are natural things that are going to come up as this couple lives together? The openness to children. You know, lots of other things like, you know, how do you work together with finances? How do you work together with, right? All kinds of things. And so that's why the church is so insistent on that time of preparation for marriage. And you know what? Our, look, our government's beginning to see that's a necessary part too. Because technically, if you can show proof that you have been through a marriage preparation in the Catholic Church, and I think otherwise also, you can get a discount on your marriage license. Some of you are nodding back there. Is that saying that the church, that even the non-church in a sense, see some value in this preparation of people for marriage? And for us as a sacramental marriage, definitely. So we know what we are committing to. Marriage means a perpetual and exclusive bond between the spouses. Notice perpetual until death do us part and exclusive. It is a ratified, a ratified and consummated marriage can never be dissolved. What does this sacrament give to the couple? The grace necessary to attain hope to attain holiness in married life and to accept responsibility for the gift of children and to provide for the welfare of those children. In other words, the sacrament again has that actual grace with it to help the couple to live that married life to the ends for which it is to be. Am I making sense here? I'm getting a few like, ah. but that's why we take marriage very seriously in the Catholic Church, right? And I'm sure some of you are sitting there, well, it can never be dissolved, but then what do you mean? Because sometimes they get what we call an annulment, right? And just briefly, I'm not going to go into that, but if it can be shown that this was not a freely consented, if it can be shown that, you know, they really were not open to the ends of marriage, right? The things that I have said are necessary for this to be a true sacramental marriage. If it can be proven those didn't exist, then the church says it wasn't a sacramental marriage. And that's what we call the annulment, which is really a declaration of annullity, is really all about. Who proves it? Who proves it? Or, or just... Okay, They're the person seeking the annulment, right, has to provide how the relationship was as they came to the marriage and in the marriage, what they call the marital dynamics. And they often will come up with witnesses who, knowing the couple before the marriage, knows that one of them made comments about, I never want to have children. Well, we say one of the ends of marriage is openness to children. So did that person really enter into it with the right intentions? Okay, so it's a, it's a process of showing all of that, right? That's a, that's a, brief, <laughs> a brief description, but I mean, we could again be here all night um, talking about that. Catholics, divorced Catholics do get an but I don't know who, who approves it. Is that a it, it approves, okay, they, we have what we call a tribunal, okay, and um, right now it's Father Joseph Fowler who is head of it, and he looks at the, you know, what has been brought in to see, listens to witnesses, right? And then you have actually what's called the defender of the bond who tries to prove that there really was a right bond. Okay, so we don't do this lightly. This is a whole process. And then if the defender says, you know, no, and if the 
other person says it, there's reasons to say it was not a true valid sacramental marriage, then it is approved and the annulment is given. You said tribunal? It's called the tribunal. Is there three people involved in this? Or there can be, okay. If need be, there can be, in a sense, a court with testimony and all. But most of it becomes rather evident by the first things that are written in. But you'll notice there's really two people working on this, right? One who's looking and finding why it's not a marriage. One who's trying to look and find out why it really was a marriage. So it's not done lightly, believe me. This is a whole process that goes to it. Okay? And with, well, not with anointing of the sick or reconciliation, but going back to that first sacrament of baptism, the church needs proof that you were baptized to be confirmed, to receive Eucharist, to be married, to be ordained, right? Reconciliation, the ones of healing, we don't have to prove it, do we? Right? But the others we do, right? And I had to prove that I was baptized in order to make vows that would be recognized by the church. I had to prove that I was confirmed, made you, well, fully initiated, confirmed, baptized, etc. Right? So that's why for all of you, we are saying we have to have a current baptismal certificate. Why am I saying current? Because you see, when you make First Communion, when you are confirmed, that are married, that gets sent, fact gets sent back to the place of baptism. Okay? Likewise, my making of vows actually went back to my place of baptism. So if you get a current baptismal certificate, it would list for those of you who have made First Communion, right? Will it have confirmation? No, because you haven't been confirmed yet, right? If you were married, it should have married. If that marriage was actually annulled, it would be recorded there also. So it tells us that you're in good standing with the church to receive the sacrament of confirmation or for the priest to be ordained or whatever. So that's why we're asking for, if you haven't given us already, a current baptismal certificate, all right? Just two other brief things, because you, you don't meet for the next two weeks. When you come back, um, Monsignor Reed it will be here talking about um, Christian morality, and the last week will be about Christian, about prayer and our life with Jesus and our prayer life, right? On January 5th, at the cathedral, and we don't have exact time yet, by the end of this, last of these sessions, we will. We will be having a reflection day, which will talk about more what the sacrament of confirmation, the gifts of the Spirit, and we will be offering the sacrament of reconciliation. Right? Um, before then, we're asking that by December, you can choose at confirmation to use your baptismal name or you can choose another name. We just need to know so we have the proper thing for records and the proper thing so that the bishop knows which name to use, right? You can have what we call a sponsor, the person who stands with you to say, I know this person, and this person wants to and is ready to be confirmed. So you can name that person, but then we have to have proof that that person is fully initiated in a practicing Catholic, which some of you are nodding. That makes sense, right? Can't be a sponsor unless you're really fully initiated and practicing Catholic. By that basically means in keeping with the marriage laws of the church. If you do not have someone to be your sponsor, we will provide someone for it. If the person you want cannot be there that day, we will provide a proxy. But that's what we'll be trying to get at the end of December and in, no, well, in December from all of you. So we've got that all together so that by the end of January 5th, you're ready to come on February 9th and be confirmed. Okay? My, I'm making sense here. All right? Um, so you have two weeks off actually now. 
and then you'll come back the first Monday of November, which I believe is the 5th, and then the 12th, okay? I'm not going to be presenting, but I will be here to open doors, etc. right? Um, I'll be around if you have questions, and I know I covered an awful lot tonight, and now you can see, though, why we did it as two parts of sacrament, because to have done all seven sacraments in one night, I'd have been talking very, 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 very rapidly with no thought about much of anything, right? So knowing we give glory to God and in thanksgiving for our own safety and in praying for those who have been damaged property-wise who are really suffering because of the effects of Hurricane Michael, let us pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.